we've got a lot of questions. I think it's been a fantastic discussion and I think uh, the audience has been very patient. And, uh, and I think, uh, I think there've been some really super questions that have been fired over here. And, uh, and I think it's been really high level discussion. And I think, uh, and it's given, I think, anybody in the business, some real food for thought. And, uh, and I think the one thing that we've learned uh, here as South Africans is to become resilient and we become used to change. We've got to accept change. <laughs> So, right. So first of all, let's, uh, let's move on to, to Johan first. There's a, a question for you, and I'm going to go through all our panel. And uh, I don't think we're going to get to all the questions, but we'll certainly try. And it's from Frank Lee, um, Johan. And he asked, is, uh, based on your presentation, what is the right pricing structure for property management services? Okay, so I uh, just want to clarify, so I would assume, you know, what commission or charge there is from the agency to their client, the, the investor landlord. So yeah. in most cases, there's obviously a percentage charge of the rental that they, uh, that they manage, of the rental property that they manage on behalf of the landlord. In most cases, uh, it is 10% plus VAT on the um, on, on managed lease and to typically one month rental. Uh, for a placement of a tenant in a property that's unmanaged. There are ever a few other nuances. So some clients say, you know, for me, it is more, it's easier to sell, let's say a five to 8% management fee. But then on top of that, they take a once off placement fee of the value of the lease over the 12 months. So they still get to the typical 10 to 12% monthly management fee. But to sell it to their clients, the investor, it's easier to say, well, we take a monthly management fee, let's just say of 5%, but we take a placement fee percentage of 7%. Obviously, if the tenant then renews, they, there's typically no additional charge uh, for, for to the landlord uh, on that, and which means in the long run, the, the landlord will get a lower management fee. As a whole, uh, across the board, I must say from a profitability point of view, it is really difficult to manage a book if you do not get a, a, a around 10% income on the properties. Typically, the African average rentals today in the market is around 8,000 Rand. So if you don't get a typical income of 8,000 Rand per property, over time, it's difficult to build a profitable book. There are ever other income streams as well. So typically the placement fee or um, application fee, the lease fee, inspection fees. Um, and then obviously if you are registered uh, or qualified to do a rear management and charge for that, um, I think there is a massive income streams. Um, agencies are all already doing all the hard work to manage a tenant in arrears. And those who can charge are really making a healthy income from that activity that they conduct on a monthly basis. So I think that is the, the aspects you got to keep in mind when you price yourself to your client. Excellent. Great. Thanks, Johan. Okay, uh, Liad, a uh, question here from uh, Franz Brits. A tenant improved and upgraded the property without the owner's consent, and he spent 200,000 rand. Why? <laughs> he doesn't want to pay any more rent, and he wants the amount to be paid by the owner, or he wants to stay the amount spent up by not paying any more rent, deducting 3,000 Rand per month, but also not paying his rent increase. And the rental contract only stated that he should help with the maintenance as the rental amount was negotiated down from 16,000 to 13,000 Rand per month. The tenant upgraded the property in a sense that does not have a normal, normal maintenance issues. Does he have a claim from the owner? That's the question. Thanks, Neil. First, let me just start off. Sorry, my team informed me that the music uh, I was hearing on my side was only on my side, not your side. So uh, I wasn't having some sort of stroke. I want you guys to know that uh, it was playing on my side. Sorry for ending of technical issues. Um, so just to France's uh, question, I think it's a very interesting one. Thank you for it. The reality is, and I'm sure Marlon hopefully will not in, in agreement with me, being one of the very learned colleagues in the industry, um, you, you, no tenant can simply offset and deduct or withhold any rental based on your lease agreement, of course. You, you need to have a lease agreement in place uh, that, that confirms that. But number two, on the improvement side of things, 
there's there's a big dis, you know, differentiator between necessary maintenance and improvement to the property. If the tenant decided to improve the property, you know, add a swimming pool for argument's sake, for lack of a better example, uh, without the landlord's express permission or without the landlord's undertaking that they'll compensate them for it, I don't believe that the tenant has any uh, claim for payment on it. If, however, the tenant needed to maintain the property in, you know, and specifically the structural integrity of the property because the landlord failed to do so, that's a different scenario altogether. But to link it back to the first part of the, of the answer, you still can't simply offset the duct or withhold your rental. You need to claim it from the landlord in, the, in a normal uh, you know, phase and process by way of legal action. In fact. So I hope that, that covers the entire question. So the simple answer is no, um, but uh, we can speak about it further offline if you like. Excellent. Great. Uh, Skulk, re-maintenance. What would you consider to be the correct number of team members required to deal with approximately 956 individual units? That's apartments, homes, as well as townhouses. That's a very good question. Um, the question that I need to ask when answering this question is whether they differentiate between inspectors and maintenance managers. But I want to pass this question to Lawrence because they have a similar side book and he can maybe explain how they do it between maintenance managers and inspectors. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Scott. So yeah, we, we have about five property inspectors that they, their responsibility is just to do inspections at properties, that's your exit inspections, your entry inspections, as well as interim inspections. And then I have a team of uh, four uh, maintenance staff or maintenance administrators within the office that deals with the, the book. Uh, each um, uh, maintenance um, administrator basically has their own amount of properties or portfolio that they are in, in, in charge of uh, dealing with all the job cards and inspections. Typically, what I can just add to that, um, Neil, is a portfolio of 120 properties um, require about um, 400 touch points on maintenance tickets in a month. So just to give an idea of how, how much effort is involved in managing a book of 120 and ensuring that you communicate proactively and also professionally, so that's what maybe to add to 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 um, Lorna's um, answer. Excellent, great, Marlon. Disclosure forms. What does boundary disputes really have to do with rentals, other than the inconvenience of building? And somebody just added a comment. I would rather have a thorough form, as in, is there grass when there should be? Like an inspection form, they need to focus on what would be fair and full usage of the property. You know, this is the whole idiosyncrasy of the act because. If you read section 67 of the Property Practitioners Act, it clearly says this mandatory disclosure form is applicable to sellers and landlords and tenants and of course uh, purchasers. It goes a little bit further to say the form can be found in the regulations, but that's why the whole problem is because if you look at the regulations, there should have been two forms. There should have been one for sellers and purchasers and there should have been one for landlords and tenants. So there is a dichotomy because the actual form does not actually refer to landlords and tenants. I have no clue why I as a tenant need to know about the boundary dispute or the pegs. You know, I'm married to an architect and I still don't know why I would have to know these things if I'm moving in on a temporary basis. As a purchaser, 100%. And the reason I'm sure Liad being a learned colleague as well would agree with me that if you are buying a property, you need to have that disclosure because ultimately it's gonna impact as to the capital appreciation, consents, if you want to do building, you need to know what you're dealing with. So the answer is a lease agreement should not deal with boundary disputes. It shouldn't have to deal with permanent defects because it's not a permanent sense of occupation. I just think that the legislator has messed up again and thrown rentals under the same rubric of sales. And that wasn't, that shouldn't have been the intention. I hope that makes sense. Right, no, absolutely. Okay, Johan, um, should the agent rather align themselves to the investor relationship as opposed to the tenant relationship? Okay, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I think the first important thing is uh, to define a client. A client is someone that pays for your service. Um, and in this case, the client is the landlord or the investor, as we like to refer to him, uh, that's paying for your service. But you also have a responsibility towards your tenant. 
So obviously you are managing the property uh, on and behalf of the landlord or investor. And obviously, there's certain undertakings that, uh, that the, the, the landlord should provide to attend. And I think the, the new Rental Housing Act actually referred to a, a, an habitable space, uh, if I remember correctly. So there's obviously a scenario where you have got to make sure that the, that the investor provides a property to the tenant that's habitable. Uh, if we can maybe ask one of the lawyers to define that a little bit later. So if there's a scenario where the, there's a geezer that has, that has burst, and the investor does not want of uh, delays answering or repair, answering your maintenance requests or approvals. I think you've got a responsibility towards a tenant to 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 kind of act uh, in his interest. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think your client is your investor, but you've got an incredible important responsibility to your tenant um, based on the agreement that you've signed with the tenant and the property that is that is renting uh, from you. So yeah, that is that is my view. Um, and in other words. If I can maybe answer your question directly, align yourself with the investor, make sure you communicate and, 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 and deliver the value you're expecting. And to do that indirectly, you have to um, um, comply with the responsibilities that you want to take to your tenant. Yes. Excellent. Great. Thanks, Johan. Liot, agents are saying they can't give the tenant's credit report to the landlord due to the Poppy Act. Is this correct? Uh, yes and no. You can't just do it. You need to have permission. It's some, something that I, I wanted to mention in my, in my talk. And sorry, I, uh, I missed that point. I was rushing Neil to make sure that you didn't hook me. But um, <laughs> absolutely, in terms of the, the Poppy Act, uh, in terms of the Consumer Protection Act, National Credit Act, you have to get permission from the consumer, uh, from the person who applies for the credit effectively or for the uh, application via tenant to give the permission, express written permission is the best thing to get. Uh, and then you can absolutely share that information with the, the tenant, with the landlord. In fact, not only are you allowed to, you, you have to. It's part and parcel of the business and what the landlord does. So it is acceptable, but get that permission, please. I don't want to see anyone in jail. <laughs> okay. All right. So a uh, question here for, um, uh, this is for Skulk. And uh, we saw that on the uh, survey that was done, that WhatsApp and email was uh, the two biggest, uh, well, the two most popular communication channels when reporting, obviously, maintenance issues. And the question is, can't you just take a screenshot of the WhatsApp chat and add it to the ticket as an attachment? Now, I know you and Lawrence had quite a long conversation on that. So maybe just your comments around that, and maybe also Lawrence wants to add his bit in as well. <laughs> I think the, the hard question is whether you want to move to a place where you create efficiency in your business. WhatsApp is definitely a tool that, that, that makes life easy, but it doesn't solve the problem. Um, so I would, I would, yes, you can do that. You can take a, a screenshots and upload them to the, into the portal, but then you're not using the solution that I was built for. And um, with my personal experience, um, I think WhatsApp is the F word in our industry. It is, <laughs> it is not supposed to be, um, be one of our tools that we use. So, uh, Lawrence, you can maybe just add to this, but um, yeah, that's, that's my input into this. Yeah, Lawrence, you want to comment? Right. There we go. Yeah, like we were saying all uh, earlier on as well, it's very unprofessional in a way if you have to share a WhatsApp message with your property investor uh, of what, what kind of issue you have. A, 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 a nice little typed out message uh, in a job card is much more professional than having a WhatsApp mm -hmm. message attached, in my, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah, I think I think you probably find that tenants find it very convenient when there's an issue. They can take a photograph and you can send it, and you can do it immediately. And uh, hopefully there can be some kind of response. That's right. But uh, so but it's you're also doing. Very... Hmm? So, so yes? um, Neil, what you're also doing is you're basically saying to your tenant that you are available 24 hours of a day, yeah. even though you have a business account. They do know that you read the email. Um, and if you allow that in your office, there's no discipline and you'll never have a life after maintenance. So I think that is another key, key um, point. No, I, I agree that it makes sense. And I think, you know, probably, you know, if we had to say Marlon, there probably are legal issues. I mean, with WhatsApp, because a lot of people prefer to keep them as a private channel, you know, as opposed to, to SMS. So it's also it's a point taken. I think good, good response. 
Question for you, Marlon. What happens with lease agreements signed prior to the new act that does not have the disclosure form? Well, the act is not retrospective. So that's that's the short answer. You don't have to worry about it retrospectively, but going forward, you must attach it to the, to the lease agreement. Okay. Simple answer. Excellent. Yeah. Great. Okay, so Johan, I'm going to ask this question. I think it was uh, pertaining to, to the second presentation you did, but uh, how do you grow the value of the property if the market puts pressure on the amount that we can obtain, et cetera, on rentals? And if you are not realistic, it will also cost the landlord money due to the property standing open with no income at all. Okay, fantastic question, especially after the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think the first point is I completely understand that you can't go and say, well, if a property is worth or was rented for 10,000 rand, uh, I want to increase the value of the client's assets. I'm now going to rent it out to 15,000 rand. And that's not just not possible. That, however, is not the only strategy to increase the value of the asset. So uh, of the, uh, let's say the value of the bottom line of the, of, of the investor. Uh, a good example is Carl Laura just spoke about it, maintenance management. If you manage effectively, you can definitely reduce the maintenance uh, cost for an investor. I'll take a simple example. If a, 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 a property manager did not do a proper ingoing inspection, there is a massive risk onto the landlord that typically will have to pay for maintenance queries during the, the lease period and specifically at the end of the lease period because the tenant just said, well, it wasn't recorded. It is not my responsibility. Another a very practical example, uh, when I was still managing properties, we had a scenario in a certain part of town where during winters, the oven or stoves would just go one by one. And uh, in most cases, that is obviously a landlord responsibility. So the, the, the managing agent would say, listen, Mr. Landlord, the oven went, so we're going to replace it. Uh, you will pay for it. Uh, literally a month later, sorry, the oven went again or the stove went again. And uh, um, in this case, the tenants has used the stove as a heater, not as a stove. So they kept to keep it on the whole day. So a very good example, a practical example of if you are managing that environment well on behalf of the investor, you will definitely reduce the running cost of his investment, which means you'll improve his bottom line, which means you increase the value of his investment. Uh, also, proactive maintenance management instead of reactive maintenance management, as an example. In commercial, can you unlock additional income streams from the, from the assets? So can you increase the GLA? If you've got a warehouse, can you put in a mezzanine to increase the GLA of the property, increasing the rental income? If you're next to a kind of a busy road, can you start marketing on the side of the building with ball ball, uh, um, or, um, displays of, of a bold ball display on your property and, and, and get additional income? So the thinking of how I manage property should not just be, well, the rent is the rent. Think about a little more holistically about the asset and how I could potentially either reduce the cost of running or managing the asset or running the asset or potentially increase the, the income Again, if I can refer to commercial, increasing GLA or other income streams that the property potentially have. And I think that should be the viewpoint of the asset manager instead of just thinking, I've just got to keep my tenant. The last comment, end of last year, um, one of my properties that I, that I have, the agency said, well, we are not, we don't advise, uh, we, 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 we increase the rent because we've, we've got a good tenant. And I did have a good tenant. But I did my own research in the market, and there were not a lot of properties on the market to rent. And I said, well, I don't think it's going to be that hard to get a proper escalation. And uh, we ended up giving a pro providing a proper escalation to the tenant. He said he's going to, didn't going to continue, not going to continue the lease. Within literally two days after starting to advertise the property, we got the rental with the escalation. So, yeah, that is just a couple of examples of viewpoints one should have when you think about the asset of the land instead of just... I've just got to feed this, uh, keep this property tenanted as far as possible. Great stuff. Some good points there. Thank you, Johan. And uh, Leo, bringing you in here again, because you brought in a very interesting topic about the whole, you know, getting debt collection as an additional source of income. And I've got a double question, double barreled one, and it's from two sources over here. The first one is uh, from Ross, and he said the chairperson of Gauteng Tribunal has stated that they will not allow debt collection charges on residential properties. So that was just the comment that was made. And secondly, aligned to that, could you please go over the 
the requirements to becoming a debt collector. So maybe just uh, run through those two. Sure. So on the first comment, uh, I think it just remains a comment, to be honest, with no disrespect. <laughs> Um, it's not regulation, it's not in play, uh, it's no one can bind anyone to that comment. I think it's a personal uh, feeling by the gentleman, but uh, and that's the most I'll say about that now. But uh, I think that what we need to comply with is, is the act, there's legislation we have to comply with, not people's opinions. So the Debt Collectors Act, on the second part of the question, clearly defines what it means that you're doing uh, in order to be registered with the Debt, uh, Debt Collectors Act. There's a process, I mean, you can Google, it's very simple as far as registering with them and paying them a yearly uh, annual fee. Uh, it's not complicated, I don't know, offhand, of course, but it's, uh, it's something that you can just Google and, and see how to register with them. Okay, perfect. Great. Um, Skulk, is it better to have a specialist, pro a specialist inspector or is it best for an agent to inspect the property themselves? Initially, uh, also depending on the size of your book, initially it will be down to the agent. Um, but as your book grows, um, I think it's definitely advisable to make use of inspectors. It also serve an arm length and being independent, opinion, opinion and, 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 a, and a report that you receive from the inspector. It does seem like the PPRA has given this uh, new opportunity in the real estate market where we'll see inspection companies um, will, will provide these services, which is exciting, I think, in one way, because a smaller company where the agent are responsible to do this as well, it does take a lot of time and it is not necessarily time building his, his or her business, but actually just administrative or time and time consuming. And it's critical to get it right. So it's that, that chicken and egg scenario. Um, in my opinion, um, looking at the, the UK market where I spent quite some time, it was always done by external companies, not by the, by the company that does the, the lease. And I actually liked that in opinion because it was objective and then no one could argue any of the facts. Great. Lawrence, how did you get it right to implement that the tenants use the link to report the maintenance? We are really struggling to get our tenants to use this. <laughs> Yeah, I saw Lucy's question there earlier on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yes, uh, uh, I was waiting for this one. So it, it, it was a struggle and it is a, a slight bit of a struggle still, if I might say so. But it all comes down to communication and explaining to your tenant the, uh, the turnaround time that it will take if you report it via a WhatsApp message or via email or via a, a, a telephone call. Like we were saying earlier on, now I've got to send the contractor out to go and have a look at the damage or what needs to be replaced. He has to come back. So it's explaining that kind of thing to the to the tenant. And I had a good example the other day with uh, one of my uh, tenants where I said, use this uh, link quickly, take the photos, put as much information in for me as possible. I can guarantee you within a few minutes I will, or for a few hours, I will have a quotation ready or and approval from the property owner. And, and it did work. It was in an hour of doing so, we got the go ahead from the property owner to to repair the items. Um, so yeah, like I said, it's just communicating and explaining those steps to the to, to the tenant. Uh, also making use of my agents when they are on site meeting with tenants to take them through those steps, of, of show them how it works, what information to put in, uh, and that kind of thing to speed up the whole process. Excellent. Great. So good advice there. Thanks, Lawrence. Okay, Marlon, it's going to be the last question, and then I'm going to ask everybody just to give their final thoughts, their wrap-up, uh, two minutes or so. And it's for you, Marlon. And it's a, first of all, comment from Moji it says, many thanks for the advice on the mandatory forms, inspections, and trust account governance. And he says, what positives, if, you, if any, have you identified from these new regulations? <laughs> Sorry, Molly, you're still on mute. Are you, Are you still on mute there, Molly? <laughs> we can't hear you. I don't know. <laughs> There's nothing. Here we go. Um, there we go. Positivity for rental agents, I assume. Huh? Is that the correct? Or for agents in general? <laughs> I, I, think, I think so, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think the one thing that it's going to come out of it is potentially to start ridding the profession of fly-by-nights. You know, it's about compliance and it's about consumer protection. And there are still people who, who don't have FFCs. Um, another positive aspect is that I know someone personally who is now 
on the PPRA, uh, Pam Snayman, who is a phenomenal estate agent, the most qualified estate agent in the country. And I'm thrilled to know that she's on the actual board. And I do believe that the intention is to rid itself of all the bad stigma attached to the EAAB. So I think a positivity is consumer protection, which means protection for landlords, protection for tenants, protection for purchasers, hopefully sellers. But I think the, those agencies which are flying below the radar, taking commission, not having signed mandates, I think it's going to pull them out um, into the open and force them to become compliant. So I'd like to think that is a positive aspect. And another positive aspect is, which I hope, and maybe I'm being a bit uh, not sensationalist, but I want the PPRA to look at exactly where the EAAB went wrong and do the antithesis of that and make it a, a flowing, empowering industry. Now's their chance. We've been waiting for this legislation since 1976. So hopefully oh, wow. it's be for the best. Excellent. Okay, great. So I'm going to go around to everybody. I'm going to ask for your final, say, uh, two-minute wrap-up, your final thoughts. I think leave the audience with something that they can take away, that they can implement. And uh, Johanna, I'm going to ask you to end off if that's okay. So I'm just going to change the order. So, Liad, if you could maybe give us your two-minute uh, kind of parting shots. Okay, so uh, for me, it's quite simple. You know, it's about adding value, being good partners with each other, um, ourselves, our colleagues, uh, our clients, landlords and tenants, not just landlords. Of course, we all act for landlords, but also helping the tenants because there are some very good tenants out there and um, avoid uh, prevention is be better than cure. Don't litigate if you can, if you can help it. Only come to Marlon and myself when you have to, when you have to evict, when there's no other option. It's just so much better for everyone to avoid those costs and avoid the angst of, of litigating. So if you can resolve things amicably, please do. If you can't, we here, and, um, and we're here to help you and we'll make sure that it gets done properly. So thank you so much for everyone for listening. Um, as I said, just in my, my the final slide that didn't really come up was um, do great, but be good when you're doing it. So always be good human beings, hopefully. And then let's work together. Always happy to, to connect further with everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you. Nice way to end off, Liad. And I think that's why you won that award. You're a nice attorney. <laughs> 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 okay, so moving on uh, to Skulk. Skulk, do you want to give us your, your parting shots, please? There's a saying, there's, there's um, birth and there's death. And in between, there's maintenance. So if you do find yourself <laughs> in maintenance, um, take this opportunity to create uh, wow experiences and to add more value to your clients. It'll be my closing thoughts. Thanks, Neil. Awesome. Thanks very much, Skok. Okay, Lawrence, your parting shots there, please. Yeah, I can echo what, what, what Skok is saying there, but also just to add, you know, building those kind of relationships with your investor, he's going to want to stay with you. He's going to want to invest in more properties and he's going to want to make use of your services, not just on the rental side, but also on the sales side to look for look at possible uh, you know, investment opportunities for him. Okay. So it's about building Excellent. relationships. Wonderful. That's, that's great. It's good to hear. And uh, last, uh, well, second last, but not least, it's Marlon. If you can give us your parting shots here, please. Thanks, Neil. I, th I think what's, what's I'd like to end up with is maybe, I don't know if it's a positive note, but it may be a food for thought, is that rental agents who manage properties invariably start acting as quasi-lawyers because they're taking their landlord's instructions, they're passing the information on to the attorney. You know, there's over 30 different types of legislation which applies to the rental property industry, the residential rental property industry. And I think if rental agents can empower themselves with knowledge, and as I say, Liad freely offered knowledge to his clients and similarly either a system where we are on retainer with a lot of agencies. I just think there is so much value to be learned that when you want to offer, when you know you take 10% every month from a rental from a landlord's rental, or you take 8% up front for a procurement, there is an expectation that you know the law. Now, you know, I always mention that maybe this is my, my, my weirdest quote. If the EAAB wanted a rental agent to be a lawyer, they would have included an LLB in their CPD. But the thing is that, that there is knowledge out there. Don't feel ashamed in asking your lawyer to empower you. Because if your landlord see that you have this knowledge available or have access to the knowledge available, they will think more of you and they will see your value. Don't ever reduce your commission. Increase your value. That's what I would, I would leave with. <laughs> 
nice, nice, nice way to end off, Marlon. And of course, last not but least, Johan, you can give us your final parting shots to everybody. I must and just ditto what Marlon just said. Don't reduce the commission, increase the value. But let me let me say it in a different way. <laughs> um, yeah, first of all, from our side, as we can meet you to all the attendees. Uh, thank you for making time. We wanted to do it uh, a week earlier uh, in, in monthly, but yeah, to get these amazing uh, speakers uh, on board, uh, everybody's diaries were that busy. And this was a date, so we really appreciate you guys tuning in for three hours uh, over the last two days uh, and listening to what we believe is just amazing guidance and advice and how we together shape the industry to become more professional and make sure that our true value that we all know we have are properly communicated to our clients out there. From a strategic point of view, I trust and I hope that some of our guidance on the structure, potentially your packaging or value proposition, helped you, assisted you to, to go into 2022 to build a healthy platform from which you guys can grow and continuously communicate your true value to your clients. Thank you very much. We look forward to another masterclass, typically around June, July this year. Um, and yeah, thank you to our speakers and all the attendees. Appreciate it. Awesome. Great. And I want to thank uh, We Connect You for being our sponsors for today. And thank you to all of our expert panelists for your valuable insights and contribution. Johan van Amerva, CEO of We Connect You, Liard Haydar, of, uh, Director of Haydar Incorporated, Toby van Amerva, Business Development Manager, We Connect You, Scott van Amerva, Director of We Connect You, Lawrence van Tonda, Rental Portfolio Manager, Annie Wilty, and Marlon Chevalier, Director of Marlon Chevalier and Associates. So thank you to our audience for joining us and your participation today. We hope that you enjoyed it. You got value from this masterclass. I encourage all of you to reach out, engage with the speakers today after this masterclass. Please contact them to get more information, some advice, or sign up for these services, products, and training. You're welcome to leave your contact details in the Q&A box below and a reference inquiry or, you know, just get somebody, a company individual that can, if you need help, reach out. That's what I would like to say. So uh, as we said, there is going to be a recording and a replay um, that will be emailed through to you. And uh, alternatively, you can go to the rei.co.za website to, vir to view virtual replays. And that should be over the next week or two. Now, from an REI perspective, we've got uh, next Thursday, same time from 12 to 1 is our weekly webinars. Uh, we still be, be unpacking the PPA again next week. Uh, you just go onto the REI website to book. And the week after, we're looking at the property structures in South Africa and Mauritian. So please join us. They're for free. You can just uh, go to the REI site to link up. Once again, thank you all for, uh, for We Connect You, for sponsoring. Um, and to all of you, stay safe and successful investing, especially investing in the best asset there is, and that is investing in yourself first. And I'd lastly like to end off with an inspirational quote from Robert Kiyosaki, uh, international author, real estate investor, and entrepreneur, who I've interviewed probably about six or seven times. And he once said, a great property manager is the key to your success in real estate. So you're playing an important role. Just remember that. So this is Neil Peterson of Real Estate Investor and host of the Ultimate Property Management Virtual Masterclass signing up. Goodbye, everybody. Have a lovely day.